Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Kristen Martin, and I am the Electronic Resources Management Librarian at the University of Chicago, and I'm hosting today's event. Our topic today is integrating the library into new methods of research. We'll be shifting gears after last week's primer on Folio Code to explore different workflows researchers use in the course of their research and how libraries and potentially Folio could support researchers in their work and in their spaces. After the presentation, we will open it up for discussion and ideas. This topic is still under active exploration and development, so this is an opportunity to both share the work that we've done so far and then hopefully get some feedback from you and ideas. So I hope that you'll be able to participate in the question and answer portion. Additionally, we're going to further the conversation beyond the forum and post a discussion topic on discuss.folio.org for additional comments, questions, and conversation. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website following the conclusion of the event. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, but we have muted everyone outside of our speakers just for the sake of sound quality. So please enter your questions and comments as they come to you in the question box within WebEx. You can also follow and participate in a conversation at Twitter using the hashtag FolioForum, but please note that we may not see comments there during the forum. Next, I'd like to introduce Jacob Jaskov, who is the founder and CEO of the Behavior Bureau. Jacob has been an innovation consultant for many years, focusing on the interplay between information, behavior, and design. In 2005, he established the European Union's largest research project at an early stage of innovation, developing new tools and methods to support innovation, innovative work. Additionally, he has consulted with Novo Nordisk for almost 10 years, where he defined their innovation methodology, established their strategic innovation office, and designed their new library and information services approach. Lately, Jacob has helped other large companies evolve their information and library services portfolios, and has just finished developing a novel vision for the future of public libraries in Denmark. As we'll see today, Jacob's work takes a point of departure in users and their often irrational behaviors and is seeking ways to make their activities more productive and more engaging. On a side note, Jacob also loves games and has developed a romantic comedy game that did well in Kickstarter this past spring. I'm going to turn the presentation rights over to Jacob and I'll let him take it away. All right, Jacob, let's make sure that you are unmuted and then you can go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? That's great. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kristen, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm so uh, happy that you have joined here. So this, uh, this, yeah, this session today will be uh, an exploratory session. Um, we'll share some of the work you've done in order to understand uh, the wider landscape of uh, libraries uh, and, uh, and thus understanding uh, where uh, things might be going. And before I go further, I will share my desktop uh, so you can see what I'm... Okay, I hope this is visible for everybody. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, so it's about integrating the library into the new methods of research. And uh, this is based on uh, work that I've done both in this project and in uh, many previous projects as well. So I've, uh, as you heard uh, in the introduction, I've been working with a large pharma company, for example, and we have studied how uh, do the researchers there uh, conduct research and how might we support their processes? How might we help them become better researchers and be more productive? Uh, and in, in that context, we, we changed a lot, uh, basically changing uh, the whole function of the library, even changing the name, uh, and also increasing the budget of the library because uh, there was so much value suddenly that could be seen from everybody, uh, how we could create value for, uh, for the researchers. So this is a topic that is of dear interest to me, and uh, I hope also that you find this interesting and that, that we somehow can see together that what, what this might mean for our project, for Folio, and for libraries in general. Okay, so uh, the agenda. First, uh, we'll discuss a bit about why are we here, what, what is this uh, kind of, what kind of session is this, and uh, what is this, what kind of activity is this. Then we'll have a look uh, at information behaviors, 
uh, and uh, information sources. So the two key parts uh, that somehow support uh, productivity uh, are not the only parts, but that is, that's what I have been visualizing here. Then uh, we'll discuss uh, what kind of uh, opportunities there might be for individuals, teams, and the wider research community, and uh, some uh, initial technology implications, and uh, finally what, what might this, this mean for folio and for libraries. And uh, I hope very much that, uh, that you will join in with your thoughts and your feedback, uh, both uh, today here, uh, but also later on the, on the, the discuss forum that we have, uh, discuss.folio.org. Uh, we will share uh, the key visuals uh, and uh, where we will uh, continue our conversation. Okay, so why are we here? So, yeah, first of all, uh, my work is very much about addressing current and emerging needs and practices of end users and libraries. So that's, that's, the, that's my role um, as uh, I have defined it and uh, as uh, the project has defined it. In, in the context of the folio project. So that's the key role I have, is to study uh, where, where, what, are, what, are, what is happening, uh, what are emerging needs, uh, but also what are current needs that, uh, that are not catered for uh, and that we can somehow support. Uh, and the, the reason to do that is, uh, is yeah, it's, it's very much inspired by the famous uh, Wayne Gretzky citation and if, if you have heard me talk before, you have heard me say this before as well. But it's about not, not going where the park is, but where it's going to be. And that's how you'll be a good uh, ice hockey player, but also how you're going to do uh, great innovation. So for us, it's about uh, understanding uh, how are things changing, uh, how might they change, both uh, independently of us, but also how might we change the landscape uh, in a better way. Uh, and. Uh, if we are doing this, then of course uh, this will have a lot of implications for uh, the individual solutions and software that we build, the architecture that we support. Uh, so it's important to understand where things are going in order not just to reproduce the existing solutions because that's that's not meaningful. There are a lot of good solutions out there today, uh, but they are not uh, good enough, uh, I would say. And uh, and the users also what the, what we are hearing from the end users they also say the same. So it's it's about learning uh, how how might the wider landscape, the technology landscape change? And thus, what, what might uh, new roles be for the library? And thus, what kind of tools and infrastructures should the library support? And, uh, and of course, what does this then mean for the power project? I've done a lot of user research. I've interviewed uh, library staff. I've interviewed the uh, faculty and students uh, in, the, in a couple of institutions, uh, so universities, um, um, in this project. And I've also done this in, in several other projects before that. So I'm, of course, also uh, using that, these insights here, even though I cannot show directly, of course, so what I've done in the other projects, because a lot of this is still confidential. Um, so user research, uh, we've done uh, workshops. Uh, the first workshop we had was, was at LA midwinter last year in January. Uh, we have had some partner workshops in Copenhagen. Uh, so, uh, that's my office you can see up in the upper right corner and the lower left corner. And then ERM workshop and uh, we had a workshop at the EBSCO user group in May. Uh, and we also have uh, a workshop uh, at the Charleston conference in a month's time. Uh, so we'll continue doing uh, workshops and sharing what we have. So this is also like a precursor to what we will share in, in, uh, in Charleston in a month's time. Um, so early precursor, precursor for that. Um, so the main question I'm interested in, as I said before, is how might we support knowledge productivity? Uh, and and this, uh, this means, uh, and of course, th this is knowledge productivity for the researchers and for, uh, for the students as well. So how might they learn better? How might they uh, uh, um, yeah, find a more interesting uh, information, relevant information? How might they produce uh, better research? Uh, how might they share and collaborate better? Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, things involved in this. Uh, and when we talk about productivity, it's not, uh, we, we do not think about this in a uh, like old school Tayloristic fashion uh, where 
where things go step by step and then suddenly uh, everything is just good. It's not a factory and we know that the university is not a knowledge factory. Uh, it's a it's a place where people think and work and learn uh, and it's and they do not just learn in the context of the place where they are but also across uh, multiple institutions. So we want to support that. Um, so we need to, in order to do this, we need to, uh, to support uh, key information behaviors and uh, the access and use of key information sources. Uh, so that's that's the way I have divided this today. Um, so yeah, let's look at these uh, information behaviors. Um, you know, and these pictures, that's, these are pictures I've, I've taken in the, in the context of my research here, and some of them are very fuzzy because I just grabbed this off a camera. Uh, so these are like small pieces uh, on the screen. So, so yeah, sorry for that, but, uh, but I couldn't show uh, uh, some of my previous work because, uh, as I said, I can, I'm not allowed to show everything. So, yeah, uh, people, when they, uh, when they have yeah, what do they do when, when they, uh, what are the information behaviors? Of course, we know that people search. Uh, and, uh, and we know that, uh, that, that this is difficult for many. Uh, so uh, this image that we have here is, is from a senior researcher at SOAS. Uh, and he actually did not understand uh, his uh, full uh, interface and his uh, options in the interface. So he did not understand uh, where his search were conducted was conducted and, uh, and and why did he get what he did get and he's a, a very senior guy uh, and this is typical uh, and, and you probably know this already so this is that there's nothing new in, the, in here so uh, so searching and, uh, and knowing where to search and knowing the right the right sources and uh, and uh, and the ways you can query these sources that's difficult for men it's also difficult to to, yeah, to discover what you already have so this is uh, another researcher, uh, and she has actually implemented uh, the Evernote Clipper in her uh, in her uh, browser. And and when she searches, uh, the Clipper shows her what she already has clipped early on. And uh, she does not really know how to use this because, uh, as you can see, the the, the names and uh, and the formatting is not uh, always perfect, and it and it's yeah it's it's difficult to relate to, but it's interesting for her, and she was glad that she has this too. Um, we also know that uh, that researchers, and this is probably a picture you will know, especially if you work with humanities, uh, that researchers have a lot of uh, physical material uh, that they uh, retain in, in many different ways. Uh, so uh, it can be papers, uh, or it can be, uh, uh, yeah, books and monographs, uh, and and especially senior researchers will have stashes and stashes and stashes. Um, it's about retaining digital material and, uh, material, and that's what I'm mostly interested in, in the context of, of this project. Uh, but also, uh, because this is uh, this is where things are going. So we know that that uh, that more and more uh, research uh, material is digital, uh, and we also know that it is uh, a terrible mess for people. So these, these are just two screenshots uh, from two different researchers. Uh, the one in the background is, is actually the way a researcher, and this is again a senior researcher, and the way he saves his uh, stuff. So it's in the downloads folder on his Mac. And so everything he gets is there. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, and it's difficult to f uh, find again and uh, and reuse, but that's how it does. And he has no uh, other processes to support that. Again, probably not so surprising for many, but this is the way things are done. The other folder is uh, is from another researcher, and she's uh, she's uh, organizing some of her work uh, in uh, in folders. Uh, and some of this is not organized, and as you can see, many of the individual articles they are not uh, renamed, uh, so they are easy to refine again. So, so it's difficult to to know what you have and and reuse that. Then, of course, uh, researchers do take notes. Uh, and this is just a picture, an example of how such a note taking might be organized. These are physical notes, um, and. Uh, 
yeah, as you can see, the there are the loads can be uh, very fragmented in many ways, and and it's it's okay for many because that's how they they still remember uh, where they have stuff, and and especially when it's in physical formats, it's easy to remember because you can put it somewhere, and and our brains are enormously good at at understanding and remembering where we have put stuff in a physical way. Uh, so desks are important for researchers, and, and uh, almost everybody I'm interviewing, they always say that their desk is so messy, and they are so sorry. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm always saying that uh, this is uh, something everybody says and tells me, but it's not mess what they have; it's, it's actually organization. And there's extremely you can learn so much about how they work from the organization they have at the desk and how they think uh, and uh, structure their thoughts. So it's 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 there's a lot of there are a lot of important uh, features and uh, and functionalities in a physical desk, and and we know that when uh, when researchers uh, begin to use more digital tools, they lose some of this functionality, and and most uh, yeah have a mix between digital tools and physical tools, uh, and it's difficult for them to navigate it uh, and uh, and organize this, especially because the digital tools really don't they, they are not uh, sensitive to, to the microprocesses of researcher. Um, and of course, they also author, uh, again, a, a very smudgy picture because that's the only picture I had of, uh, of uh, what, I, what of one of my uh, interviewees uh, did author. Um, but they do author, of course, and it's, it's important. And, so, and, and, and how they do this, of course, uh, varies a lot. Uh, some of some do this uh, as the first thing they they, uh, they do when they when they start a research project. So they just start writing, uh, and then later on they do research. Uh, others they do the it's the other way around, so starting research before they write anything. And it depends on your seniority, on your experience, and of course your thought processes. Um, so this is also important. And then uh, of course uh, getting and giving feedback. Uh, this is again a screenshot. Uh, I did uh, from my webcam or from my camp when I interviewed. So you can see that this is an email from academia.edu, uh, and this researcher and this is uh, a very senior researcher. He uh, he he gets these emails uh, from his uh, fellows, his peers, uh, where they have when they have written something new uh, that is still a work in progress. Uh, he gets this uh, and he uh, gives the feedback, and it's just a time limited access that he gets. So he can only get access this for two weeks or something like that. Uh, and uh, he says that this functionality is probably the most uh, radically, the most radical change in his uh, work process, and that the most valuable process that he has uh, now uh, got. Uh, from the digital tools available today, that that he can actually access research as it's happening, the, the authoring as it's happening, and that he can share his work in progress. It's uh, it's a huge boon for his work, and he's uh, he's saying that he's uh, during a year he's he's probably only downloading and saving two to three academic articles, not more than that, because he's not interested in what's published out there, because it's already too late and it's too old. Uh, so within his field uh, and uh, on his uh, list, uh, stage of seniority, what's interesting is to follow the thought leaders and and, ex and directly be in interaction with them. So it, uh, it's really something that bypasses the library, bypasses a lot of the things that we uh, find uh, important in library uh, because he's he's not interested in that. That's simply too old for him. It's too slow. Uh, so all the networks, the, the hidden networks, uh, they are interesting. And, and I also, I've also interviewed uh, much uh, less senior researchers, so a postdoc, for example, and she's, uh, she was also, she also said that this is probably the thing that is changing most now for her work, and it's, it's, it's having a, 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 a real impact. On her work, and it, this is this sharing of research assets happening. Uh, of course, she's still uh, she's still following what's what's published out there. She does not know she she has not experienced yet yet as the old researcher here. Uh, but this direct interaction that's what's most interesting for her as well. 
and, and, and even as a postdoc, she's now so specialized, so she knows most of what's happening out there in the world and knows this directly. Um, yeah, so uh, so basically there are a lot of processes, and uh, what I've done is try to map them um, and uh, create. Uh, I've created this uh, big map, uh, and uh, I cannot see uh, if you look in your faces, but probably you're a bit dis disoriented uh, because there's so much here. But uh, I, I hope that you that you somehow can uh, can follow me. Yeah. Uh, so just a moment because I want. I have a pen here. Okay. So uh, you can see down uh, in the corner we have a legend. Uh, we have no solutions yet uh, shown on the screen because they will come later. Um, but if we uh, somehow segment the research project uh, process, we can see that uh, that initially there's of course some uh, some kind of background knowledge and background. Uh, motivation. So that's the red ones uh, here. Uh, so you need to have uh, awareness of a field before you even begin to explore this, and you need to have some kind of incentive to explore this, uh, knowing that this is interesting uh, for you, or this is uh, interesting for uh, society, or this is something where when new stuff is happening, or uh, this is something where if you go into this, you will get a lot of grants. Uh, there might be many different types of incentives, but it's important, of course, to understand these and, and, and know what your incentives are in order to go somewhere. But also, initially, just have an, a background awareness. Uh, and then, uh, when you do your research, uh, and of course, this is just one way to show this, because uh, as I just talked about before, you could also start with just authoring right away when you know a lot of stuff before you even begin research. Uh, but let's just take it a, a bit a bit more linearly. So uh, you will, uh, when you do research, uh, you will of course need to find stuff. Uh, and where you find this uh, yeah, depends on the sources you have available and the sources you know about uh, and the, the sources you prioritize. You need to so either implicitly or explicitly select a source. Uh, and what uh, it's also clear, uh, and what many librarians uh, on the floor they know, is that uh, that after a while, most researchers they have uh, their preferred sources and they go there. So when you introduce a new source, uh, a new tool, a new search engine, whatever, um, it's very difficult for them, uh, for for librarians to move people over there, even though these sources might be superior, because people have their habits, and and uh, and they always yeah seems to start at the same place. Uh, and of course, a good librarianship is about knowing what sources are, are relevant and good. So if we can help people select the, uh, the most relevant sources for them, then it's a boom. So already here we have a, a challenge. People select sources. Uh, then if it's a more uh, a written source uh, or, uh, or an encyclopedic source, you, uh, you might just browse the material. So, so there's a so it's it's not necessary necessary that you do some search because many sources are of course not search oriented. So, so there's this loop here. Uh, but uh, for most uh, and in most contexts, of course, we will have uh, a search process, and this is this circular one here. So, uh, when you have a source, you do a, a query, you filter, you expand, you, you find related stuff, depending on, on the tools you have available in, in, the, in the search engine. Uh, you get an enriched uh, list of content. So, the, and the enriched might mean that you, you get a, a list of content and you might get uh, front covers, you might get uh, citations, you might get other stuff than just uh, uh, the, the direct metadata about uh, about the material, uh, and this is uh, very important. This enrichment because uh, there's a lot of value to be uh, to be gathered from here, as you probably know. Um, then, uh, when you have your list, you'll uh, scan the list and evaluate the content in the, this enriched list, uh, and uh, you might just say that there's nothing there, so you you restart the process either selecting a new source, but most often just making a new query or just stopping the process. And then, uh, or you might uh, go and select 
uh, some of the content uh, either one piece at a time or uh, multiple pieces. And again, uh, when we look at uh, at how people work uh, and and do search, we see uh, multiple behaviors here. So some uh, very much like to be within the context of a list and have uh, this overview and just like uh, pre-select stuff, uh, either just opening this in the in the multiple windows or tabs in a browser uh, without going there and just staying in the list. Uh, or it, uh, if, if, the, if the result list has some functionality where you can uh, uh, where you can mark individual uh, records, then you can just mark them and then save them later on. So there are different ways to do that. But most people do not do this. They find a thing in the list, go there, so they click directly on the on the item. So just go away from the list. Look at the item, and then uh, uh, yeah, as, uh, so they get access, of course, to the to the content, uh, and then skim it, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll find they they will find out if if they will keep it or not. Um, so retain it or not retain it. So many people do that, and then they uh, they will restart the process back and forth. Uh, uh, so. So yeah, so, there are, so this is the, the most common process, and it's often very um, inefficient uh, because people lose track of where they are and uh, where they are heading, uh, and what they were interested in, and what was available. Uh, so it's it's a very fragmented process. So already here we see that that the tools that that they have, uh, of course, they somehow implicitly uh, guide them because they. Many people suppose that, okay, now I have results, then I click on this and I go read this, and then I go back again, so back and forth. So, and the, the tools they have, they, they, they somehow implicitly encourage this behavior, and it's, uh, it's not very efficient. It's, it's, and people feel that they, uh, they often drown in this information, especially if they are going on a more exploratory uh, uh, journey, where they try to learn new stuff and, and move uh, beyond what they know uh, already. Um, and it's difficult to do, and that's also uh, one of the things I have learned from my uh, interviews and my research is that uh, because it's so difficult to do, many people refrain from doing this because uh, it's easier just to stay within known domains uh, or, or do some early uh, quick uh, queries and then find the stuff and then keep it and, and uh, rather than exploring too much simply because it's too, it's too difficult and it's not really encouraging. The thing. So, so that's some of the challenges there. Uh, but uh, but I suppose okay. People do uh, are good at this. Uh, somehow they get a lot of content and they retain it. Uh, then uh, the next step is that they uh, they will structure and prioritize and annotate it. Uh, and many don't do this. Uh, as we saw, uh, many researchers uh, just have like a, a one big fold of everything. Of course. Most don't do this. Most have some kind of structure, but it's it's not a, a huge uh, amount of structure they have. Uh, some uh, do use reference managers, for example, and this helps them structure. Uh, but the reason for them to use reference managers is often not because they can structure material, but because it's it's a it's a good tool for them later on when they do reference uh, when they do referencing. So, so we know a lot of reference managers have uh, structuring capabilities, uh, but they're not used widely simply because people uh, don't understand what they can do. That means that when they have to find the content, <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, so they have a lot of stuff already, and, uh, and uh, it's difficult for them to do. Of course, you can do desktop search if you know what you have, uh, but, if, but if you have a lot of stuff and you have worked uh, for many years within a, within a field, uh, you're, you, you'll probably not remember everything that is important for you, and then it's difficult for you to find it again. But anyway, let's assume you find what you need, then you of course read it. So, and uh, and many people go directly from skimming, retaining, reading, uh, and then uh, and uh, when they read, many do this in, in physical format. So they annotate it physically. A few do annotate it digitally, the material they have. And again, this means that, the, that when, they, when they are working uh, with something at a later stage, unless they have access to a physical material, uh, the physical archives, it's difficult for them to reuse. And of course, it's even more difficult to share with others. Few author content. Uh, 
after you have read uh, probably a lot of stuff, uh, of course, if you might do some outlining initially. Uh, you'll also do some uh, modeling uh, and supporting uh, your ideas in other ways, uh, 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 your ideas and concepts. And that, and that that can be done through data or it can be done uh, um, conceptually as well. Um, so, the, so of course, there's there's a huge process in itself there. How how do you uh, do you do your analysis? How do you think and how do you reflect and stuff? And a lot of this uh, depends on the notes that you have taken uh, during the process. Uh, and the notes you take, uh, you can take them in in many different contexts. So we know that uh, that some researchers they already do take notes uh, when they do queries uh, and uh, initial searches because already there at that time they learn a lot of stuff. So it's it's important to remember that that uh, scanning and evaluating content in the list uh, it's actually about a reading and learning sort of reflective activity. So it's important this one, um, and and some researchers. Do uh, do know this, uh, and they do. Uh, they are good at taking notes, but many do not. I've seen uh, librarians being better at this because librarians, uh, yeah, are more experienced somehow with uh, with such processes. So I've seen more librarians being better at, at making notes during the the, the search process and uh, and reflecting upon what they find and and how the terms are changing and what terms are important and 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 how the field might look like. This is like early stage note taking, but already important. And of course, then you later on when you're reading, you you make much deeper notes. But uh, but even this early note taking helps you uh, in navigating uh, the field and knowing uh, what there is to learn. If you only focus on the on the, uh, on the stuff that you really deep uh, that that you read uh, really deeply, then uh, then you're there's a risk of of having a more narrow perspective. Okay. So uh, we can see that there's a lot of uh, things going on here. Uh, of course, uh, there are some additional processes. When you have your stuff, you might uh, get uh, some more background information. Uh, you might get your su supporting data. Uh, and this is uh, especially difficult today. So uh, a few journals, they are especially within the sciences uh, and uh, natural sciences and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, biological sciences. They are uh, they are good at uh, at uh, giving access to uh, the data sets that are uh, supporting a journal article, for example. But most uh, most supporting data is not available at all. Uh, so, so there's a huge challenge there uh, about uh, how how do how can I get uh, the supporting data or can I do that? And uh, mostly people are not even thinking about this as an option. So when the people read a journal article, they they read the article itself uh, and of course access the data as it's presented in the article. But but that's it. And and because it's so rare to have this uh, additional data available, it's also something that People don't ask for because it's 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 not yeah it's it's just simply not on their mind. Um, but but this this might be uh, important. And then you know that there are a lot of changes now in the library landscape about open uh, data. Uh, and we know, f uh, for example, in the UK, uh, there's a mandate now that all researchers have to uh, publish uh, their uh, supporting uh, data. Uh, as they publish uh, the article, <clears throat> and, and this data has to be publicly available, unless there are some ethical reasons not to have it available. So, uh, so uh, universities, universities in the UK, they are struggling now to find out how to publish this uh, and make this available. Uh, and uh, for example, JISC in the UK, uh, they, they have a, a, a big process to, to drive this. Uh, but it's still very fragmented, and it's not uh, very user friendly, and it's 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 probably not going to help the most researchers when they're going to to search for supporting data if they don't going to do that. Okay, so, uh, so there are a lot of yeah yeah the small processes. One of the important things that I've also seen uh, in my research is that uh, when you ask researchers about what 
uh, what kind of research uh, information is, uh, how, where do they get most of their research information? It's not through search. So everything I've just talked about is just a, say, minor process. So not, of course, a very, uh, very small process. It's still a big one, but it's not the most important process. The most important process for most researchers is actually this one that I'm in the drawing up. Yeah. So it's it's the, the pushed information, what you subscribe to and what you get uh, from your peers. Um, and um, as we talked about earlier on, uh, this uh, feedback here uh, from uh, between the researchers where they share stuff in the, in the closed networks, that's that's an example. Oh, I, and uh, yeah, so that's a, that's an example. Um, but uh, but there are many other ways, of course, to do this uh, this part here. Uh, so so researchers do subscribe to the table of contents. They subscribe to uh, to tweets, it's, uh, to Twitter accounts. They subscribe to social media. They subscribe to journals uh, where they just get them directly, uh, and they are part of uh, list serves uh, and and many different uh, types of processes uh, and. And, and they get uh, this content uh, directly. And, the, and probably, and most often, they get far too much uh, compared to what they can process. So there's a lot of uh, early evaluation skimming happening. Uh, this is uh, the most regular way a researcher stays up to date within his or her field. Um, that means also, of course, that, uh, that when you are working as a researcher, it's important that, that you can share your stuff as well with your peers and also, of course, with your students if you are uh, teaching. Um, so you can, you can share uh, both the stuff that you find, but especially the stuff that you're working on. Um, and this is very important. And it's, it's not just something that you share when you're doing, uh, getting peer reviews. At that time, it's, it's Yes, as I've heard from some teachers, I say it's 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 late in the process when you get re peer reviews. So of course it's interesting, but it's it's more refinement. It's not the big thoughts that are happening there. Um, so uh, so the earlier you can share, uh, the more uh, progress you can have uh, and good feedback you can have on your work. Okay, uh, so uh, a lot of uh, processes. Um, I think, uh, I should, yeah, it could be good perhaps if you have some questions to to this one, uh, especially. Uh, I would like, yeah, perhaps just open up questions here, just if, if there's something you don't understand or uh, I need to have explained better. better. And, uh, yeah, Kristen, is, you can manage that. Yes. Um, yeah, feel free to type your questions in the question box. If you do have anything right now, we'll just take a moment um, and we can talk about them. I am not seeing anything come up right now, Jacob. So okay. um, if you'd like to go on and people um, feel free to type your questions as they come to you and you know, you'll have more opportunity to talk as the presentation goes on. I'm impressed. This must have been perfectly clear then. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, so we see that the, the, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff uh, happening here. And uh, if, uh, if I just, uh, uh, the uh, screen here, uh, erase it then. So uh, the most, the, the things that libraries, as I understand it, and of course I'm, a, I'm an outsider, so you may correct me, and it, this might be provocative, but what libraries are mostly interested in and what they manage is this one. So ensuring that people can get access to the content, and of course that they have some, uh, Sources available and can do some uh, some search. Uh, that's the process that libraries are interested in, and and that's what I'm seeing that libraries somehow uh, support. Um, and it's uh, and and what I see is that uh, that all the rest is something that the researchers themselves have to manage. And uh, and it's on, honestly it's just a fragmented mess for them. 
So, uh, and, and I think it, this applies to everybody I have interviewed. I have not interviewed a single person yet who thinks that they have uh, a good way to do this. Uh, it's a mess. So it's a mess uh, of, when you are searching. If you are really doing this in a fast, speedy way, then uh, then you'll have a backlog of stuff that you somehow need to organize if you begin to organize it. And it's so difficult to do, so you, you don't just don't organize. And if you you choose not to do this very exploratory search, of course, then you you might be better at managing your work, uh, but then you're not exploring so widely, uh, and 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 this might be a limit. Uh, and if you're sharing stuff with anybody, uh, then it's a mess. Uh, how can you do this? Of course, uh, what people do now is uh, they might have shared drop boxes um, where they can share this <coughs> in teams or with their students. And, and this is, uh, of course, not allowed always because uh, we have a lot of IP rights and, uh, and regulations here that we, that we need to, of course, take care of. But researchers do that because they want to, to share stuff. They, can, they might work together in some Google, uh, Google Docs uh, or similar. Uh, but again, it's, it's difficult for them to do, and it's difficult to, for them to have an integrated process. Uh, however, on the other hand, if, if you begin to think about this in a more integrated way, there are a lot of opportunities here where, uh, where the researchers might, uh, might really uh, improve on what they get when they are when they are searching uh, and uh, when they are sharing and uh, uh, and, and when they're working on, on their on their stuff, so this uh, this picture here, uh, uh, where we have Evernote integrated um, in a in a uh, search uh, tool, that's that's like the the, the baby the first baby step towards uh, one, uh, one of the things and opportunities I'm seeing that, that might be very, very interesting. This is stuff that you have. Uh, it's not stuff that your colleagues have, so you don't really know what they have, but this is stuff that at least that you have. That, and and if, this, if this somehow uh, could inform your queries uh, and uh, inform what you get, uh, and also uh, if, if, of course, the parallel search into your own stuff also was much better than it is today. There might be a lot of uh, support there, but that, that's just one of the visions I'm I'm heading towards. Okay, so that's the research process. Um, another perspective uh, I want to share and discuss is uh, it's about uh, the information sources, and of course it's closely related. Uh, so, so we we know that there are a lot of information sources that are relevant here. And um, let me just make sure that I can draw here. Okay, so we have uh, two horizontal lines that are very important in this uh, image. So everything below uh, this line here, that's that's what people what what's private. That is, that's not shared information. And everything that is above this line here, that's publicly accessible somehow. Either directly or uh, or through subs subscriptions. And then we have in between we have some kind of closed networks where it's semi open or semi closed depending on the network. Um, and there are a lot of different types of uh, uh, of information. What libraries? Uh, and again, uh, I I might be biased from my external perspective, but what I'm seeing at least, what libraries I'm most interested in, is this box here. So uh, it's uh, the closed access public public uh, closed access publications. So either something that you need to buy the physical material uh, that you somehow have in your holdings, or a digital material that you have uh, in your as a subscription. Uh, so so th so that's uh, that's what what libraries manage uh, somehow, uh, and of course uh, that's that's what they then uh, offer uh, to their uh, users, uh, so uh, researchers and, uh, and students, uh, of and of course they there might be some uh, library guides uh, that point toward a, a larger landscape, but mostly uh, the focus is on this one, uh, and of course then you might be part of a consortium where uh, where you somehow need to coordinate what you have and and what your partner 
partner sats your your partner institution sats uh, so so this is the main uh, thing of course uh, we we see a big movement towards uh, open access uh, publications that's not something that you acquire so so uh, many uh, librarians are not caring so much about it because you don't need to spend money on this so it's less important somehow <laughs> uh, even though uh, for users they don't care if it's uh, whether it's something that it's acquired or not they just just want to be able to find it and navigate it and use it in easy ways and of course uh, the big um, discovery engines out there uh, they they might support both stuff both things so uh, so the focus uh, from this perspective is that okay users might find everything so it's, it's not about findability that it's it's not that that's what's so interesting for us as lab libraries it's more, much more important for us to ensure access uh, but users uh, they care uh, about many more things and, and then for them findability is it's not so good as as it's perceived uh, access is okay uh, so uh, again, from what I have learned uh, when I've interviewed, it's not the access is not a problem. It's it's all the other things. So libraries are doing well on on what they perceive as the core mission. But uh, but this this universe of information uh, is just a small piece of the pie. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of more interesting things that uh, users uh, might find interesting. Of course, there are funding opportunities uh, i've i've colored this red to show that this links to this motivation and incentive uh, so funding uh, opportunities and uh, research applications uh, that might be interesting for users to get access to so uh, and and have this in in the context of of their work uh, so when they're searching uh, if this was uh, if, they, if this was somehow visible in their interfaces in their interactions that Oh, this this field or, or this this uh, domain, it's some something that is uh, of high value. Of course, many senior researchers they would know about this within their own field, uh, or everybody would know that. But uh, again, when you are exploring or, or you're going across, or if you're a, a junior researcher, this this might not be evident for you. Um, then uh, we have all these research notes. I've put them mostly in the private sphere. Some uh, research notes might in principle be shared uh, but I would say it's mostly in principle because most of them are not shared uh, and of course there are a lot of good reasons not to share uh, so I'm not saying that everything should be shared but there are also good reasons to share stuff some stuff at least especially when you're working in a team uh, and this, this is not uh, easy uh, available and, uh, and easy to do especially if you're having uh, note-taking processes away from the screen on your in, in your desk uh, desk oriented uh, physical tools uh, which as it is today often are better than digital tools um, so you have uh, note-taking then you uh, of course you, you might uh, have a research design uh, and your protocols this this kind of information that there are a few uh, repositories out there that try to make this available publicly uh, but it's it's really just a tiny tiny sliver of information that is public, publicly accessible most of this is uh, private and uh, of course some of this is uh, also shared in closed networks then we have this big 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 chunk uh, the data uh, data as, as it relates to uh, to specific projects or uh, multiple projects because of course data can be reused so as, as it is today, a lot of data is only reused by the individual researcher or the individual teams because it's simply not available. Uh, so the, of course, so the, that's that's the that's the reason why we we talk about having a public uh, and open access uh, data, uh, and uh, this might be interesting to uh, to support somehow as well. So what what. If when you are searching for stuff, uh, also uh, become aware that the data is available, or, or when you just uh, want the data, you you have it easily available and, and present. Then, uh, what I've heard in my interviews that is most important is work in progress. Uh, that's uh, that's where the thinking is happening, um, and uh, this is uh, like key. And today it's not something that the libraries 
are involved in it at all. Uh, or most likely, uh, uh, because this is this is the domain of the researcher, and uh, and, and this is something he or she does. Uh, but we we can see that those who are good at sharing and using some of these sharing tools uh, here in the middle, they feel uh, that they get a huge value out of this. So so we have uh, types of scholarly communication. That is not a set set in stone yet because it's it's, it's extremely dynamic uh, what's shared uh, and it's highly interactive. So we have uh, something that is, uh, I would say, in principle, something that should be in, in, in the domain of libraries because libraries care about scholarly communication and giving access to this and and supporting it. Um, but it's happening in in other domains outside of the library. Um, yeah, then I have uh, some other things that uh, they are not called out because they they relate to multiple. Uh, so we have dissertations on thesis done by students and uh, and uh, yeah, PhD students. Then we have uh, peer reviews. Again, uh, I'm not aware of many of these that are shared in closed networks. Uh, so most of them, of course, there's the peer review network in itself is Say this is a closed network, but most of this is just, yeah, you say very private uh, and not shared. Uh, then we have something that is shared widely, uh, that's the science news and commentary that is happening in the wider media. Uh, and this helps uh, making people aware of what's happening. Uh, uh, this, so, so following science broadly, of course, if you are within the scientific field and academic field, but also helps the public uh, learn about what's interesting and and, uh, and thus disseminate the knowledge. Uh, this is not there's no uh, good linkage between uh, what's in what's happening in the science news and what's happening in the closed uh, access networks uh, or closed access publications. Uh, um, we know that uh, of course there, there are some movements towards uh, S. Uh, towards uh, making better assessment of, of research uh, using uh, different old metric uh, approaches. Uh, but, but this is uh, a, a, a source uh, can use. Oh, I, could, I saw there was a, a comment there, but I couldn't read it because it disappeared on the screen. Oh, well, Jacob, if you want to take a moment, um, I think one of the things that at least is on the mind of one person and I would agree with is the, the area that you're considering with um, this research in progress and the closed networks is something that university libraries have been getting more actively involved in mm -hmm. lately, um, particularly, you know, trying to find ways for people that are working on in, during the creation process and during the research process to find mm -hmm. collaborators to um, to link up through, you know, maybe the academia.edu example or um, some of the uh, social networks for scientists. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're, and then, um, and lastly, we're thinking that this gets beyond kind of a resource management topic into scholarly communications. Um, yeah. And so hopefully we'll get some feedback from individuals uh, who are experts in scholarly communications and libraries. Yes. Uh, you're totally right. So, of course, we, we see a lot of things happening uh, with academia.edu and similar social networks uh, for scientists. Uh, and, and librarians are introducing them uh, in, the, in the organizations. Uh, what I'm also uh, somehow uh, alluding to is that, that many of these tools, they are, uh, at least as it is as today, it's, it's a fragmented universe. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, a network like uh, Mentally uh, that uh, that is still in the making <laughs> somehow, uh, but can be used. Uh, there's Academia.eu, uh, there's uh, ResearchGate, and and they are uh, they are valuable, and and uh, we can also hear this from users. But it's still not they are still not very integrated in the uh, form for many users. Of course, for some users, they are very integrated. They, they have uh, millions of users out there. So, of course, many people uh, would have benefited. I have not interviewed any uh, that, that have 
uh, this huge integration, but of course, this is just a limit about uh, of uh, who I have interviewed. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, yeah, this goes uh, beyond uh, resource management. This goes uh, to the wider landscape of, of uh, yeah, scholarly communication as well. Okay, so uh, science news and commentary, and then we have this, this social uh, media sharing. And of course, yes, I should just talk about these social media networks might be uh, specifically focused on uh, on academic stuff, or they might be more broad, like Twitter, where a lot of uh, important exchanges are happening. Um, so we have uh, important information sources here, um, and the, the yeah, the questions I'm I'm now uh, interested in and, and, and trying to raise is if if uh, researchers they have processes uh, that are very broad, uh, and that they have processes that are very broad and that they involve a lot of different aspects, different a lot of different tools, uh, and they involve a lot of different types of information. Uh, how can we support them? How can we help them uh, become more productive? Uh, how can, uh, what can we do with our tools, uh, with our infrastructures to help them? Uh, and, uh, and I think that this is, uh, this is the interesting thing to raise. As, uh, as the projects uh, as that we have, uh, the Foley project, because of, co of course we are, we are trying to rethink uh, a lot of uh, infrastructural uh, things uh, behind the library. Uh, and if we can have these things in mind, uh, both the many multiple types of sources and the multiple types of processes, uh, then uh, we can uh, hopefully support better connections uh, across all these things. So, yes, yeah, so there are a lot of opportunities for individuals, teams, and the wider research community. And, and what I'm trying to will list here in a moment, that's just uh, a small piece of it. So, um, first of all, they, I've, I've tried to map out, uh, uh, and you can probably not read most of this here, and that's okay. Uh, I've, I've, I've done a, a big mapping of relevant solutions, tools, and infrastructures that, are, that, uh, that relate to the individual uh, overall, oops, uh, and this one. Uh, that relates to the overall uh, part of the process. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, some tools that, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, solutions, infrastructures that might support awareness of the field. So of course, different types of recommenders as you might be able to read here, uh, or dis discipline landscapes. Uh, that might help you navigate stuff. When you're uh, when you want uh, when you, uh, if you want to you have support about uh, knowing what's important and not, uh, you might, for example, monitor research grants. This is already happening, but can we integrate this in the, some of the tools uh, uh, across so it's easier available? Uh, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, the big thing that has happened. In the last uh, 10 years within the libraries is, uh, is the, to get the web scale discovery interfaces. But how can we go beyond them and include much more uh, information? Uh, and is it and is it something that uh, that the providers should do, or is it something that the libraries can uh, support? Uh, uh, and of course, the, the providers will uh, expand uh, continuously. Uh, I think that, that that has been quite clear the last uh, several years, uh, but we all, we still need uh, uh, probably more specific uh, sources, more specific tools that are, that are uh, relevant for the specific uh, research communities that we cater for in the individual uh, institutions uh, or the, yeah, the, the disciplines that that, that we have uh, uh, prevalent at the in, uh, institution and uh, and the. Uh, generic uh, tools, they might not have everything that is relevant there. So, so how can a library integrate uh, a lot of different types of sources uh, and make them available, uh, probably in cooperation with uh, some external vendors as well? And that's some of the questions that are interesting. And of course, uh, what then uh, if we go beyond that, then uh, how, how can a library play, play a more active role in, uh, in the supporting uh, the sharing um, that's happening, uh, and also the, all the subscriptions that are happening there. Uh, so, 
so, so, so there are a lot of uh, um, Jacob? There. Yes. I wonder if you could zoom in to the certain parts that you're looking at on this slide so that um, we can read them a little bit better. Yes, I can. Uh, I will. Uh, one moment. So I need to escape this, and I have this available here. Uh, in another tool because I that's just what we want to do this in. Um, okay. So yeah. Uh, I've talked about awareness of the field, this is the landscape and the personalized recommenders, incentives to explore, monitor and grant. Uh, the discovery interfaces uh, that are interesting. Some something that might be interesting to integrate uh, would be different types of quality indicators. So opinion and uh, commentary aggregation. So as uh, as people, as researchers or, uh, or others uh, comment on uh, on individual uh, pieces of uh, of research, can this be made available in the in the research tools, uh, in the discovery interfaces? Uh, uh, can we somehow uh, show uh, for each library what what are their collection levels? Uh, there's, there's a uh, uh, a standard called collection level indicators that a lot of you probably know about that, that can help uh, classify how much uh, how big is our focus within different types of uh, for di for different uh, disciplines or different fields. Uh, a, a big problem for many when they are looking in, in, into different sources is uh, knowing how much there's to find, how much. Uh, how much quality can I get? And of course, this is the implicit knowledge and the explicit knowledge many librarians have. So, so how much stuff is there, and how much good stuff is there where where I'm looking? This is difficult when you're searching uh, using uh, and selecting different sources. So, yeah, different types of source quality indicators. Um, I, I will skip a lot of this because there's so much here. And we don't have time for everything, but it's just to to give you a gist of uh, a lot of the things that. Uh, we are exploring and seeing uh, how uh, what uh, what important things might connect uh, and uh, and how might we uh, uh, go beyond uh, what we have today. Uh, yeah, um, of course, one of the things that uh, that is also the, um, a big agenda item is uh, how can we share metadata? How can we uh, either have uh, like shared uh, indexes or uh, doing uh, linked data or uh, harvesting our own metadata uh, to uh, to increase uh, the quality of, of our index and, 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 and provide better uh, enrichment for the list of content that people get. Uh, and again, this is another type of, uh, you could say, acquisition. It's not acquisition of uh, of uh, pieces of content or material, it's acquisition of data and, and integration of data. Uh, and how can we do this in order to enrich everything? Uh, and, and there are a lot of different types of uh, sources of data that might be relevant. Um, then we have note taking, uh, and, and often you would say, okay, why should I? And I very care about note taking because this is uh, a key research process. But if note taking already takes place during uh, search and scanning, uh, can we somehow support this in the context of where people are? Uh, and I can uh, I, I can give you a spoiler that yes, you can <laughs> because I've I've developed a tool in the context of another project uh, where, where this was made available, and this was. Uh, deemed as one of the most innovative uh, search uh, tools uh, the users have ever seen because they were suddenly able to to make uh, notes in the context of the research process. Um, so so that, that that might be interesting. So as you browse, as you scan, of course, later on as you spin, uh, as you read, uh, to, uh, to have some kind of integration of, uh, of uh, note taking and how you can do this. Uh, was there are many different types of solutions, uh, uh, but uh, but, uh, but it would be extremely helpful for many researchers because suddenly they would uh, not just depend on what they remember, but uh, would be able to to actually have notes. And some of this might also be automated note taking. So as they search, uh, could this 
uh, be captured uh, and saved for later, so they know what they have searched, how much stuff they found, what they actually chose to uh, to retain, uh, and what they uh, somehow missed. And and later on, when they come back and do a, a redo uh, some similar searches, they might even be warned that uh, okay, you have actually found this and this before, uh, and uh, would be interested in this. Uh, so there are a lot of yeah opportunities again when you when you begin to integrate information across. Uh, and of course, if if you then integrate uh, the stuff that people have retained, as we saw in this uh, Evernote example, uh, then you might also be able to to do better uh, uh, recommendation, better search. Um, yeah, I think I will just I, I will I won't go into detail here because there's so much here. Um, uh, but just to to yeah to give you a gist about. Uh, of, uh, of what we have been focused on and looked at. Um, so, yeah, individual opportunities. Uh, we know, yeah, it might for individuals they might uh, have, uh, yeah, they might have uh, informed their search by uh, what a researcher has already interacted with. So uh, somehow use real interest data, meaning data about uh, what have they searched, what have they retained, what have they actually read. What have they annotated? What have they evaluated, or shared, or cited? And this could be used for uh, some kind of automatic recommendation. And uh, within an, a completely different type of field, something similar is already out there. Uh, so I guess all of you know Spotify, uh, and all of you know uh, Apple uh, Music or uh, similar uh, consumer tools out there for a music uh, discovery and music uh, consumption. Uh, this is based on real interest data. So what are you actually searching for? What are you choosing to, to retain? What are you actually listening to? Uh, there's no annotation feature in, uh, in, the, in these tools because it's not what you do. Uh, there are evaluation features. You might uh, give the, the individual uh, pieces of music a star or a, or a heart or whatever. You can share this. Uh, you don't cite stuff there, but you can make a, a your own uh, playlist. So there are a lot of uh, similar tools out there today within a, a, a completely different domain that was also extremely fragmented at one point in time. Uh, and it's a domain that, uh, that has uh, become uh, extremely integrated the last couple of years. Uh, and we see uh, hugely changing uh, business models there. Business models that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that are changing uh, yeah, the landscape of who's earning money and uh, who, who's uh, who's disintermediated and who's central suddenly, uh, and uh, of course there are some uh, some movements towards such a thing within the uh, within uh, the library sector as well and within the research sector. So we have a tool like uh, Readcube that is also trying to link into some uh, some of these pieces. So so. Uh, Follows what you're reading, uh, what what you're saving, uh, in order to give yeah, some kind of data. But it's it's not really integrated yet. Uh, but there are some uh, some baby steps towards this. Uh, and the interesting thing for us, in our I would say from our perspective, is okay. How can uh, how can we ensure that uh, all this stays open? Uh, because of course there's huge value in integration. But there's also a huge risk if everything is integrated in a closed network. Uh, then uh, how can we uh, collaborate across networks? So people who have saved stuff in uh, Spotify and listening in Spotify, they cannot easily share with the people who are using Apple Music, for example, because that's two different networks and and they are competing. Uh, and we don't want to have this within uh, our world. So can we do something with Folio that can support? This level of integration, uh, but also ensure openness. That's one of the big questions I would uh, pose. Okay, so search informed by what you have searched for. Uh, capturing of research notes across multiple contexts. That's interesting. Uh, this this might be some something we do, or it might just be something that is supported uh, by uh, by some of uh, the APIs and uh, and infrastructures we have. So I'm not sure that we will do this directly, uh, uh, but it's, it's something that it's 
is very valuable and might be very very valuable and I think this should at least be uh, enabled uh, and uh, yeah finally enabling better individual intelligence for discovery and evaluation of research so knowing what have you already looked at uh, and uh, flagging this so not just uh, doing automatic recommendations but also just showing this to you as a user that you have interacted with this somehow or with this author so this is a favorite author of yours uh, show this uh, so it's easily uh, visible when you're seeing a list of results results uh, when you have done a search so you're searching for something and you get an enriched list and this list also somehow marks that oh this this author is some someone that you have uh, read a lot from and and uh, rated very highly so this might be interesting for you or this is an author that uh, one of your colleagues have done so that's something that uh, that might be a team opportunity uh, so uh, enabling collective intelligence uh, for discovery and evaluation of research for teams so again using this really interest data uh, for some uh, uh, yeah, both automatic recommendation and visual flagging uh, for people who are working in that team. Uh, this is again something I've seen uh, a lot. When people do research, they do this mostly on their own. That's the way uh, research is structured. Uh, of course, they are sharing stuff, they're collaborating, but uh, most uh, search on the screen is done individually, and, uh, and what you're subscribing to is done individually, and, and in a in a context where many people are interested in the same, everybody will get the same uh, subscriptions and read the same stuff uh, and annot and make annotations uh, independently of each other. So there's no uh, no sharing of uh, of work or you don't build upon what others have done already. But if if we can somehow begin to integrate or, uh, and capture data across all these processes, we might also be able to, to support teamwork much better in the enabling collective intelligence. Uh, of course, this would also open up for a lot of community-wide opportunities. So uh, again, depending on how uh, on what data you would open up and what you would keep uh, closed, because uh, we're not saying that everything should be uh, forced to open, but there are a lot of good reasons not to open everything up. But what you choose to open up, this can help others as well in, when they are searching so finding out what is interesting what's important today where are the things what's what's the most where, where's the hot stuff today uh, and uh, again senior researchers might know this from from uh, uh, direct interactions as, at least within their own field but if you're not within your own field or if you're not one of the senior researchers uh, you will gain a lot of uh, value uh, from this uh, so, so we see some some opportunities there. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is basically some of uh, the overall thinking I'm having. Uh, and uh, we'll start. We are just starting uh, the discussions now internally about what what does this mean? Uh, what are the technology implications? What might this mean for Folio? Uh, and we have no conclusions yet at all. So this is early stage stuff, but it's it's just to open up and, and see that that the knowledge landscape is much broader and the behaviors within this knowledge landscape, they are quite diverse uh, and the information sources within this uh, landscape, they are also diverse. Uh, and uh, we might, might do a lot to support this. So there might be some it's about yeah, how can we support stable references and links uh, across tools? Uh, so of course, this is about uh, linked data, and it's about shared KBs or indexes or catalogs, address lists, whatever we call it. It's about uh, yeah, the overall UI. It's about uh, having more dynamic records, uh, more like a Git than a, a stable catalog. So where record changes. Uh, because as as it goes along, because and 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 change is part of uh, deeply ingrained in the process, uh, because we know that uh, a thing that is uh, just a uh, work in progress document will be completely different uh, than something that is published. But how can we uh, track this? And, and of course, not everything should be tracked. But can we do this? And how can we link the data to uh, to the articles and perhaps to the working programs, to the commentaries, etc. So having a more uh, uh, 
dynamic and, and diverse and, uh, and comprehensive records somehow. Uh, also support data collection across tools. So uh, yes, yeah, support data science, big data recommendations uh, tools, uh, because there's so much information uh, happening there. And, uh, and again, this would, this, there should be some support for uh, for management of privacy. Uh, we know not all countries would support uh, social inviting everything, and not all users would be happy to do this. But uh, on the other hand, we know that users are very happy when when they're using Spotify and get very good recommendations. So why shouldn't the researchers be happy with this? So we at least make this available. And of course, index much more in the published stuff. Yeah, and what might this mean for Folio? Uh, <laughs> we don't know yet, because this is uh, early stage stuff. So we, we are aiming to have some, uh, some open conversations and start these now. Uh, of course, today, but also Charleston in a month's time. And we'll uh, try to make some thought leader groups uh, discussing uh, what are the big implications for this. Yeah, and hopefully uh, uh, we hear some of your thoughts now and some of your feedback. Uh, and uh, I know some of this, what I've said, is uh, has been uh, perhaps drawn up a bit uh, more uh, black and white than reality, but that's, yeah. But that's also what I'm, at least what I'm experiencing when I'm speaking with users. I know libraries, libraries and libraries, have a lot of uh, uh, stuff on their agenda, but uh, but uh, but most of this is not out there and has a little impact yet. So, so there's a lot of opportunity, and uh, both uh, for uh, for folio, of course, but of course in the end for, for everything. Okay, please uh, share your thoughts and feedback. Hi, Jacob. We have a question that came in earlier, um, and I think you may have partially answered this. This uh, came in when you were talking about the information-seeking behavior um, mm -hmm. model. And um, the question is about wondering, I would think that many peer researchers are generating their own data, like through experiments mm -hmm. or from the field. And how does that kind of research fit in with the information-seeking model that you had presented? Oh, that's very good. So <laughs> the model I've had, uh, yeah, the majority of uh, a researcher's work is <laughs> is about uh, generating your own data. So of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening there. Uh, and and when you are out there in the field, if you are uh, depending on what you're doing, of course, if you are a social scientist, you would uh, do interviews or statistical work. Uh, and if you're a, a, a person who works in the, within the sciences, you would do uh, experiments and stuff like that. If you are, for example, doing experiments, you would have, uh, uh, we know that from, from, from some of the pharma companies, but also within some uh, other uh, more uh, structured settings, they have lab notebooks uh, where everything is uh, documented, uh, both because this helps internal sharing, but also because this ensures that you can get uh, uh, patents for what you're doing, um, because uh, you need to know when, when stuff is invented. Uh, and these lab notebooks, they might, uh, of course, also reference uh, stuff across, uh, and uh, and some of this information might also support uh, your searches. So there might be different types of searches. So if you're searching for uh, molecular structures, for example, uh, this is relevant for uh, in relation to what you already have looked at and the data you have, the, the analysis you have made, but it also relates to to the wider landscape. Uh, and I think uh, some interesting uh, avenues into this field uh, is, 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 uh, are done by some of companies like IBM, where they're developing uh, their uh, big AI uh, engines towards uh, reading capability. And, and they can read both uh, what's published out there, but also the stuff that you are working on and combine it. Uh, so if, if you are thinking of a few years ahead, uh, with uh, machine learning and uh, AI, there's a lot of stuff uh, where you could link your data work with uh, what's already out there and with your analysis and your thought processes. Uh, so this is also interesting. And I think uh, one of the things uh, our our software should at least uh, think about is that uh, that most of the stuff that will be read in 15, 20 years time will not be read by humans. It will be read by machines. So, uh, so everything that is searched and used and uh, and uh, analyzed <laughs> it should also be 
machine readable and available and, and thus and this links everything together. This is a, a bit more futuristic, but but highly relevant and, and, and some companies are doing this today. Thanks. Um, we have a couple of comments here that I think are on the same theme, um, mm -hmm. looking at systems that can be more responsive to the researcher or the and what their needs are. Um, like an automatic recommendation might be really helpful for a faculty member in a particular discipline, but it might not make a lot of sense if you're an undergraduate and you're moving from discipline to discipline and you're just beginning your research proj project. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, there's a comment from another participant about wanting the whole experience of discovery to be more fluid and things right now seem very rigid. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess what, what, what I'm hearing come out of this is that whatever kind of system or whatever kind of support we have is going to have to be in some ways personalizable or um, be able to take into account the background and the type of work that's being done. I could and agree I, more. <laughs> yeah, so uh, fully agree. And of course, that, uh, and, and you uh, a student who, who just has some assignments and needs to check out stuff without a lot of pre-existing knowledge would have different needs for discovery than a, uh, an, a very experienced person who has done work within the field for many, many years. Yes, many years. But I, I, I generally believe that that, uh, that recommendations and, and especially uh, better ranking, better evaluation, better navigation uh, in the discipline, uh, of course, might help inexperienced uh, users and uh, and when they are when they're getting a, a huge list of, of stuff and, and and they feel that they drown in this if they are at all doing this and not just reading what what they have been assigned to do but if they are doing a bit of research it's difficult for them to have an overview and and the more we can the more additional data uh, so quality indicators of any kind that can help them and that they can understand uh, would be extremely valuable so uh, and of course, uh, this might mean that this, this is kind of necessarily then be based on what, upon what the uh, student has done before because there's not so much history. But then uh, we might know what are the uh, thought leaders actually reading today. Uh, so what are, the, uh, what are my teachers reading? What are they interested in? What are the thought leaders interested in? And if this could be flagged and made visible, then of course, uh, this might help the students navigate it in some ways now. Um, one thought that has occurred to me, particularly when looking at your information uh, mm -hmm. landscape and the different sources, um, that area of publications that has been perhaps most traditionally the library domain, it's been particularly complex and, mm -hmm. and hard for libraries to keep on top of that, you know, let alone all these other areas of information sources coming in. And, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about how libraries could expand their realm while kind of struggling with even managing their access to the published resources mm. that are out there. Yeah. So I th and uh, again, this, this might be just an outside of you. <laughs> so please uh, take it for what it is. But when I've interviewed, uh, Librarians, I see a lot of work that is done that is just uh, where, where it's the same work is done in many places. The, uh, the stuff is cataloged, for example, uh, and that there's a lot of data that is entered in many different places. And of course, this is because that's what catalogers are, are doing, and that's how libraries perceive that they create value. That's by upkeeping a very high level, uh, good catalog. But if if we relax this requirement a bit and say, okay, what can we spend our time on? in other ways, perhaps. Perhaps just having this centralized catalog resources, and we know that the copy cataloging is very prevalent already, uh, but uh, could we just say, okay, there are, we have some, a few very good catalogs and everybody depends on them. There's some kind of union catalog. And then, then we just uh, care about what was our holdings. And then uh, the resources we, just, we could spend on, on integrating uh, other stuff as well. So that, that, and of course that would not free up enough resources to catalog everything else because there's so much more, but at least uh, that would then help 
uh, free up integration, perhaps integration resources, uh, and then uh, we might uh, have other types of vendors who are doing other stuff. And, and we know that there are vendors out there who are trying to do something about, uh, yeah, uh, cataloging the world of information, uh, as Google somehow says. So, so there are a lot of yeah, vendors out there, and, and of course, some of this is not. Uh, catalog because it's it's simply uh, not open or it's not uh, in the, uh, opened up. And here uh, our uh, platform might help as well, uh, and we could get uh, create some, perhaps some shared efforts, uh, create some kind of uh, shared uh, resource uh, uh, that automatically uh, indexes uh, other stuff or assigns uh, DOIs for a material. Uh, because uh, of course we should. Then catalog not just the uh, journals but also individual articles. So, 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 that, so our tools might also do some stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know what uh, yet because this is something that is extremely open. But I guess if if we are relaxing some requirements in what the library does, and then especially focusing on sharing resources more in the, uh, the core areas as they are perceived today, we might have resources to do more beyond that. And if especially if we can are focused on sharing and doing stuff in the open uh, as of course <laughs> the, the, it's the whole mantra of our project uh, to, do, to share and do stuff that is open uh, we might uh, actually come with quite fun all right well well thank you jacob we are um we're running low on time mm -hmm. and you know i just want to comment with relation to that last thing sometimes i feel like just managing entitlements is a very difficult process, um, mm -hmm. more difficult than maybe it should be. So that, that probably is another area where a system could assist us in taking some of that workload off of individual libraries. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So of course, we will, uh, in, the, in our work, and that's, this, this work has also been done in preparation for, for example, our uh, uh, resource management uh, uh, solutions that we will uh, begin to work on now. So, so how can our resource management uh, tools become more easy and uh, and uh, uh, and productive and help us be productive? So, managing entitlements and all this. Uh, yeah. So um, if you give me back the screen, I just have a link I'd like to share with people um, before we close. So. Yeah, and I just need to see uh, stop sharing, uh, and uh, I can do what to give you this. Um, just pull the ball over next to my name. Ah, there. Okay, ah, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm just going to put up my screen here just to say thank you for everybody for participating in the forum. And I'd like to thank Jacob as well as everybody who was here, and I hope that you found this useful, and you'll continue to be involved in the future forums as well as in the conversation that we hope will continue um, on the discuss.folio.org site. Jacob did share with me the graphics for the information seeking information sources and potential solutions, and I created, I put them up there on discuss. And it's easy for you to join Discuss. You can create an account and add comments, or if you want to share this with other people to get feedback from those who couldn't come to the forum today, that would be great. Uh, additionally, we do have a Slack channel for resource management. And if you search for Slack on discuss.folio.org, you'll find a page where you can get an automatic invitation to join. And then the channel for this particular aspect right now is uh, resource management. So that could be another place where we could continue the discussion further. And that's all we have today. So thank you again. And we will talk to you soon. We're still working on getting our next topic up and running, but you'll be hearing about it shortly.